5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Too Confused to Lose. I am your host, Ashton Hamlegs Bass. Today is Thursday, February 24th. It is a dreary day, but we have some big things coming for you today. But before we get started, I have some big news. I have to apologize. Our last interaction fell flat, didn't come off the way I wanted it to. This is going to be a high energy sports show, and that's what you deserve. So, without any further intro, uh, introductions or What's the word I'm looking for? Adu, the head of Chowan's college football program, Mr. Mark Hall. How are you doing this evening, Mark? Doing great. Appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to be here. Oh, we love it, man. We uh we enjoy supporting the community, and especially when we have somebody as knowledgeable as yourself on, it always makes the show feel more full. So before we get started, let's go ahead and 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 backtrack and lay the groundwork for this thing. You guys had a really, really good year this year. Uh, you started off hot. It, it kind of it kind of wavered there towards the end, but still overall had a great year. Had two players on the uh, all-regional team, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, talk to me about those two guys, man. How, how, how did you find them? Uh, you know, how did you know they were special, or did it just all kind of come about? Well, Bryce Witt, the QB, he's been at Chowan since 2017. Uh, he's a kid we recruited out of Dinwiddie County up in Virginia. Um, been with us for five years because of the COVID year. Uh, started every game for us since he came to Chowan. So, I mean, it was just, you know, he's had a great career. He finishes the all-time touchdown leader in the CIAA. Um, holds every Chowan record that could be broken. Um, so, he had a great senior year and got recognized for it. And then Amik Watkins, our receiver, he actually is a kid from Wilmington, went to a school out in Chicago as a freshman, played there. Um, he actually reached out to us about wanting to get closer to home, transferred to Juwan. Uh, and he was with us in 18 and 19, had the COVID year, and then he had an awesome senior season, led the conference in yards, catches touchdowns, punt return touchdowns. Um, kid, great kid, great player. You know, we're going to be hurting to see those guys leave. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, not listen guys this horse is already dead it's been dead for a year but i'm gonna break out the mountain we're gonna beat it just a little bit more tell us how bad covid really was for sports yeah covid sucks um and <laughs> just be honest with you guys i mean obviously you know that but you know it really set us back just a little bit you know i had just taken the job and we were just kind of getting things rolling for you know that first two months of a semester and then you know, we're on spring break, our kids are all at home, and then all of a sudden, boom, they, they don't come back, and we don't see them again until August. Um, and then when they did come back, you know, that first semester those guys was back, you know, I think we were flying by the seat of our pants and just, am I allowed to cuss on this show? Oh, go for it. Every day was a shit show. Um, <laughs> so uh, we were doing the best we could. You know, the kids hung in there. We were able to fortunately have workouts. Um, you know, we created an outdoor weight room in the back of the pond center. You know, we just had to be creative to try to get work done. Um, and then we went home for Christmas, came back January 21, and things started to slowly but surely get back to normal for us. And, you know, in the end, I think it helped us um, that extra time. Just, you know, we needed it as a program. But, you know, it, it mentally affected a lot of guys more than anything. For sure. So was, was the biggest hurdle in your mind, was it – just the loops and hoops you had to go through with testing and vaccinations, or was it just with all that downtime trying to get your conditioning back where you wanted to be? I think a little bit of everything. The conditioning part was big. Um, you know, I don't care if these guys are young or not. They sit around, they don't do anything for six, seven months. Guys get grossly out of shape. You know, the guys that are naturally heavy get heavier. The guys that need weight lose the weight. Um, you know, so that the, that was a challenge for sure, just getting back here and getting physically ready to go. And then the whole testing thing, Chihuahua, the one thing I will say, Chuan did a great job with that. Um, you know, we had plenty of testing available. You know, they had a good plan in place. So nobody likes getting that swab stuck up into their brain. Um, so we had to get that, you know, get used to doing that. But, you know, that part, once we got used to it, was fine. Well, it looks like the country is finally going to start opening up again. Uh, the mayor, or maybe the governor of New York, recently said that uh, they're getting ready to roll back some of their uh, vaccination restriction mandates. 
and I know a lot of the other places around the country have already done so, or if not, they are in the process of doing so. So I'm sure that'll help loosen things up. So we, we've covered this outstanding season, and even though it was a great season, there's still nowhere to go but up, especially for a college like Chowan. Uh, you know, it, we, we realize it's, it's not one of, we're not talking about Auburn or Georgia or, or Alabama, but it is, a, it is a community here that I think will rally around any sports team that shows that they're putting forth the effort to be good. That being said, this is probably, in my opinion, the hardest part of a college football program's year, and that is recruiting. So with, with COVID winding down finally and everything else that's going on, how is recruiting going? How, how, does, how does our next year look? Recruiting actually is going great. Um, we are in a really good spot here on you know, towards the end of February, I think I counted today where we have 42 commits um, for this recruiting class right now. Um, a lot of talent on both sides of the ball. You know, the way we want to build the team is O-line, D-line, and then obviously the quarterback position. So we put a lot of time and effort into that. Um, you know, so we got a lot of good kids, a lot of good local kids coming to Chawan um, that we're excited about. Um, so... It helps when you win, um, so kids are wanting to come to Chuan and check us out and see what we did to kind of get over the hump and do what we did in the fall of 21. So, you know, so far so good. We're not quite done yet. We still have a lot, uh, the last few spots to fill, but I feel really good about where we are. I, I realize it's probably a little different for college than it is pro, but, you know, everybody says that the NFL is a copycat league, and I feel like the safest starting place for any football team, college, pro, or otherwise, is always going to be the front seven on either side of the ball. That being said, even with you being in college ball, how much of what you have to do to stay competitive is you know, everybody's running spread offenses or everybody's doing this. How much of that goes into your game planning and recruiting or how much of that do you just kind of let fall into place? Well, I mean, the way we do, we, you know, I run the offense at Chuan. I hired a great defensive coordinator in Colin Neely. Uh, everything we do is about the players. Um, the nice thing about college is we get to recruit the kids we think fit what we want to do. Um, so we recruit to our scheme. Um, hopefully we do a really good job in doing that so we can run the plays and the things we want to do. Um, but if for whatever reason we aren't as good at a certain position, it's on us as coaches to adjust um, and do what the players do well. Um, and I think that's what we do a good job of with our staff at Chuan is putting the players in a position to be successful um, so they can thrive and make the plays we need them to make. Um, the O-line, D-line is always the hardest to recruit because, like you said, all the way up to the NFL, to Alabama, to Chawan, everybody in the world's looking for big people that can run, tackle the QB, block. Um, so kids are getting recruited up a level, um, typically, if they got the size and the athleticism. So... You know, it's a battle for kids in that in those positions, and you know we just got to work at it 365, 24 seven, just to get the kids we need. And I'm sure that you and your coaching staff have done the best job possible. I have no doubt we're going to see an excellent season coming up. That being said, you just said it yourself, man. It's a it's a 365 day a year job. How much time do you get to take off usually in the off season? Uh, I mean, I work. You know, I don't take a lot of time off. Um, I'm sure my wife and kids would love me to do uh, more of that. You know, the summertime, you know, I'm from Ohio. My wife's from Ohio. Um, most of our family's up in Ohio, so we go up there for at least a week. Um, usually try to go to a beach sometime in the summer for a week, obviously over the holidays. So, you know, there's times throughout the year we get time off. Um, but, you know, even when I'm away, you know, thinking about football, you know, talking to the kids, constantly recruiting. So, you know, it's just, it comes with the territory. Oh, of course, of course. Now, everybody's got their thing. You know, I do a sports show. I'm a barber. I play music. My getaway is golf. What is Coach Hall's getaway from football? I'm actually ashamed to say this. I really don't have a getaway. <laughs> I'd say... Uh, That's how you know you've got a hard work to coach show on. <laughs> Right there. <laughs> my kids, you know, I have a daughter that's 13, getting ready to be uh, 14, and I have a 10, getting ready to be 11-year-old daughter, and they're involved in stuff, and I try my best to be involved with them, um, obviously, and then my wife. So if I'm not doing football I'm with my family, we're doing something in that regard. Um, but, 
Yeah, I'm not the typical guy, I guess. You know, people ask, do I golf? Do I fish? Do I? Yeah, I just don't. If I got free time, I'm doing football or I'm with the family. So. That's awesome. Now, with with your girls, obviously, you and myself are in the same boat. We both have two daughters. Are are they? Are we looking at some next generation up sports stars, or or what are we into now? I think I mean they're working at it. My oldest daughter plays volleyball, um, and then my youngest plays softball. So, you know, the one thing I think for me, I just let them do what interests them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not trying to push sports on them. You know, it'd be great if they did. Um, if that's what they decided to do, if they don't, they don't. But, you know, I just tell them whatever they do, they got to give it everything they got and put everything into it. And if they feel like they got to, if they're going to half-ass it, then it ain't for them. I couldn't have said it better myself. So being from Ohio, let's go ahead and get the elephant out of the room. Bengals couldn't quite pull it off this year. Now, I know we had talked earlier and you said that Maybe this just wasn't going to be the year for him anyway. So, watching that game, what did what did you take away? What do you think? What do you think about those boys? Well, I was pulling hard for the Bengals. I'm not a Bengals fan. Um, I was rooting for them. I'm a 49er fan, so I can't root for the Rams. Um, you know, it was. You know, I think it was just the Rams time. It was just set up for them. You know, with the game being in LA, and you know, they put pushed all the chips in. Got Matt Stafford, got Von Miller, you know, they had the team. You know, I think the Bengals are going to be around for the next 10 to 15 years if Joe Burrow can stay healthy. They got a lot of weapons. Obviously, they got to get better on the O-line. That, that's, that is the hole in that that team seems so – there's a couple guys on the defensive line. They sub in and out, 91 and 94, and please forgive me, I can't remember their names. Big dudes, strong dudes, quick dudes. And obviously, they've got a great secondary on the decent defensive side of the ball. With Jamar Chase, man, and the uh, Uzama, they've got great offensive weapons. Man, that offensive line looks like Swiss cheese. It yeah, is. they struggled. Um, you know, I think they, they got killed all year because, you know, last year in the draft, they had a couple tackles they could have taken. They did it. They took Jamar Chase. You know, Jamar Chase is going to be a Hall of Famer if he stays healthy. So, I mean, in the end, you can't necessarily blame him. But they do got some things they got to get figured out. They got, you know, if I heard correctly, I think they got a decent amount of cap space going into this offseason. So I, I guarantee they're going to be investing in that offensive line this offseason. From what I understand, they've got a ton of cap space. And uh, it looks like, man, the formula right now, until somebody changes it again, is go out and spend all the money you possibly can in offseason and hope for the best. You know, for the past two years, that's what we've seen win the championship. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're up against it here. We're going to take. Southern Bank on Main Street in Murfreesboro is the bank whose interest is in you. We are the home of Southern Hospitality Gold Checking with tons of benefits for you, our customer. Pay your bills or deposit checks quickly and efficiently through our mobile banking app. Our Southern Business Pro offers custom small business solutions for your business without all the headaches. Need a loan or a mortgage? Let the friendly and helpful staff at Southern Bank of Murfreesboro help you navigate the process properly and carefully. No matter what your banking or finance needs may be, Southern Bank on Main Street in Murfreesboro is your only choice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back still talking, uh, talking with Coach Hall from Chowan University's football program. And I want to talk with him about something that is in recent years has changed the game of college football. I think has made it easier for players to go where they fit, and that is the transfer portal. You see these guys all the time in D1, D2 schools using the transfer portal, whether it be a quarterback, who didn't realize he was going into a quarterback competition with four other guys who'd been there for years, or it be somebody who didn't particularly care for the coaching staff or what have you, moved to another school. How big has the transfer portal been for you guys? We uh, we use the transfer portal. So, you know, for me, I'm not one that is gonna speak down on the transfer portal. I, obviously, everything has its pros and cons. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think in today's college football, if you're not using the transfer portal as part of your recruiting, um, you're behind. You know, for us, we're not 100% living and dying by the transfer portal, but, you know, we 
we are looking for guys at certain positions that we feel like can come in and help our team right away for sure. Well, let's let's expand upon that. What get, give the viewers and listeners a rundown of what a student athlete in your college football program's life is like on the day to day during the college football season. So during the season, I mean, for us, we get up. You know, we have our lift groups. You know, first group starts at six a.m. Uh, we get all our lifting out of the way prior to classes. Um, you know, a lot of the kids have 8 a.m. classes here at Chuan, so they get their lift in between 6 and 8 in the morning, go get breakfast, go to class. Uh, we allow them to be students throughout the day, so from 8 to 2.30-ish, 3 o'clock at the latest, you know, all they do is school. Um, now, during that time, if they need to get into the training room or something, they'll get into the training room, get treatments. Uh, we start our pre-practice meetings at 3. Uh, usually we meet from about 3 to 3.45, and then we're on the field at 4. And then we go from 4 to 6, 6.15. Then they go to the calf, get dinner. Uh, and then depending on the night, uh, evening, after dinner, they'll have a study table. Um, and then usually if they don't have study table, depending on their position group, they might have a position meeting. So usually, you know, their day-to-day -day routine is from 6 a.m. to about 9 p.m and they're jam-packed with stuff to do. Um, and if they're a guy that's not in study table, they're probably doing some kind of studying after nine o'clock if they're doing well in their classes, obviously. So, you know, it's a 12 to 18 hour day for those guys. It's go, go, go. Um, there's not a lot of downtime during the season. Their only off day is really Sunday um, for us, at least at Chawan. Um, I don't let those guys in the football building whatsoever. I want them to get away mentally, physically, be a regular dude for a day, uh, focus on school, focus on rest, watch some NFL, hang out with their girlfriend, whatever they're doing on Sunday, they get Sunday to themselves, and then we get back to work on Monday morning. That's awesome. I mean, you know, it's, we hate, we hate to say it, but you know, some kids, they, they thrive under pressure, and the only way you're gonna get the best out of them is you have to keep them busy from sun up to sundown, you know, wake up, football, school, sleep. That's that's how that's how you get the most out of most people. That being said, and I know coaches hate to do this, but I'm gonna ask you anyway, describe yourself as a coach. You know, I think for me I'm more Yeah, you know, I hate to use the word players coach because that kind of sounds like I'm soft on the guys because I'm not. Um, the one thing I think I've gotten better with as I've gotten older is being able to, you know, when we're on the field, it's all business. We want to have fun. We're getting work done. We're trying to be the best we can. And then when we're all outside the field, you know, I'm just a regular guy. Um, you know, I'm a regular guy with my players. You know, I really enjoy having a relationship with those guys. You know, I like having sports talks, debates with them, um, just seeing what's going on with their regular day-to-day -day life. So, you know, I think it's important as coaches that you turn on and off the switch best you can. Because um, if you're full go, coaching, yelling, screaming all the time, these kids today, they, they're just going to shut you down and not even listen. So, And for me, I'm just not like that naturally as a person. I'm just a regular dude who just happens to coach college football. So, um, you know, so love being out there. You know, we coach them hard. We have a high expectation for them. Um, but there's also just – you know, being a regular person and having a normal conversation like everybody else does. Well, I think that it definitely helps, especially, you know, in college where you have to recruit, you know, these, even though there are some kids being paid, you know, most of the time it's still a recruiting, recruiting gig. And the better you are as a recru uh, recruiter, the better your football team is going to be most days. And you're right, most kids aren't going to respond to the in-your-face cussing, you know, old Lombardi-style coaches from way back in the day. You've got to adjust and evolve just like the kids do. Yeah, 100%. But, uh, so more of an open door policy, you'd say? 100% open door policy. I mean, I spend so much time at the football building that I'm around those guys more than I am my own kids. So my job would probably suck if I just sat in there all day by myself. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, uh, I love when the guys come in. Like I said, I'll drop whatever I'm doing just to talk to them, hang with them. You know, I don't know how many – debates I've had with guys on who's better, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. I actually get enjoyment out of those kind of things. So <laughs> definitely an open door policy. Well, let's go ahead and kick that door open for a second. Not the MJ, okay. LeBron James 
I do have an answer for you if you ever want to ask. <laughs> we may get there. First, let's talk about this. You're, you said you're a Niners fan. Oh, yeah. Who's the quarterback this year? Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. I'm calling it now. You heard it here first. <laughs> Coach all that you want. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. I never expected. So, so you're telling me that Tom Brady is going to finish this movie that he is producing and starring in, get back into training camp with the TV12 method, and then start next year as a San Francisco 49er. I think there's a reason he hasn't turned his paperwork into the NFL. I think he's gonna. He's only willing to play for one team, and that's his hometown team, the team he grew up rooting for, and that's the 49ers. I think the Niners are going to trade Jimmy G to the uh, Tampa Bay Bucks for the rights of Tom Brady. He'll take the next six months to do whatever that he needs to do. He'll show up to training camp in July, and they'll win the Super Bowl. I, I, when you talk about hot take, boy, that one is on hot take, fire. Yeah. That one is scorching hot. Now, I, you make some valid points, though. I mean, it, it is not without the realm of possibility. I mean, it doesn't It doesn't look like Tampa Bay is going to be a contender next year. Um, Gronk still doesn't know what he wants to do. He has said publicly, though, he'd like to go up to Cincinnati and play with Joe Burrow. Now, whether or not that's a real, reality, another story. But while we're talking about QBs, Russell Wilson has scrubbed his social media of everything Seahawks related. There's no more ties on any of the social media to the team that he's currently playing for. And he got a big deal with them not too long ago, if I'm not mistaken. Where, where's Russ going? Hey, you know, he's got to be going somewhere. You don't just, you don't just de- delete the team you play for unless you plan on making some kind of move. Another hot take here. Okay, here we go. I don't think he's leaving anywhere. I think he's staying in Seattle. I think this movie's been played out a few times. These QBs, these big time stars, you know, they scrub their social media just to get a reaction out of the media to kind of get this narrative pushed just to put pressure on the front office and the team to make the moves that he thinks they need to make. Um, if you look at the history of the NFL, rarely do franchise quarterbacks, unless they're on the back end of their career, do they get traded. They get stuck in the situation. They sign these long-term deals. They don't go anywhere. Um, I just don't see Russell Wilson leaving Seattle. I'm sure there's things he feels like the organization needs to do to make him better. But, I mean, look at Aaron Rodgers. He's, he's left Green Bay about 100 times. But, <laughs> so, he, uh, he's and not it, going anywhere. And he's still anywhere. leaving. Yeah, correct. So, I mean, <laughs> Russell Wilson, I think, will be a Seattle Seahawk for the foreseeable future. Will he finish his career there? I certainly hope he does. Um, but I don't think he's going to be anywhere different than Seattle in 2022. Well, and, you know, when I was in my younger days, and in Russell's younger days for that matter, I remember going and sitting on the 50-yard line at North Carolina State and watching him chuck the ball all over the field when he was playing for the Wolfpack. The guy's amazing. He had more offensive line help at NC State than I think he's had in years in Seattle. I mean, it, that, that's another team that it just seems like he's, he is constantly running for his life. The problem with the NFL is as soon as the quarterback signs a big deal, it's hard to put other pieces around them with the salary cap and those kind of things. These guys are getting paid more and more money. Um, so whenever – that's why, I mean, the Rams kind of defied the odds this year because Stafford was on a big deal. But the guys on their rookie contracts, it's the best way to win. You get a good quarterback within his four, first five years if he's a first-round pick. He's on a rookie deal. You try to build the team up as much as you can, and then before you sign that guy to the extension, as soon as he gets the extension, your good players got to start leaving. As soon as they gave Russell Wilson the money, the good players had to leave. You know, So it's kind of one of those catch-22s. Tom Brady, he's been the one guy that's been willing to take less. You know, He's never been the highest-paid quarterback in the league. So you know, it's just one of those things. Well, when NFL contracts today are – I don't want, ladies and gentlemen, math was my worst subject. So I have no idea how they're doing these contracts now where you see guys who are restructuring their contracts, making the last two, three years of your contract voidable, spreading out their salary over signing bonuses that you can spread throughout the life of the contract. There are ways around the salary cap as we have seen, but it for some teams, it seems to work, and but at some point you can only kick the can down the road so far before it's eventually going to bite you in the butt. And that's why I think teams that aren't doing 
this spread out spread out what you're paying these guys now and take the L on the back end, they're gonna have a longevity, not necessarily being, you know, championship contenders, but being a good football team to where you're gonna see this, I think it's gonna fizzle out sooner than people think it is. I mean, take a team like the Patriots. Year before last, they were what, a seven and nine yep. team this year that had 10 wins. Mac Jones is a guy, uh, he's, in my opinion, he still doesn't have any real weapons around him. They brought in a couple of aging wide receivers to try and help him. The only real long-term threat they brought in is probably Hunter Henry, the tight end. Um, that being said, you know, th this is another thing they're, they're already talking about, franchise tagging uh, J.C. Jackson, their uh, defensive back. Um, Judon, he's a great uh, defensive end, but he's on the tail end of his career at this point. But you never see Bill Belichick go out and just spend and do like some of these other teams are doing. That being said, I want to talk about a team that it seems like no matter what they do, it's always going to be a dumpster fire. And by dumpster fire, that may be a little rough on them, but let's be honest, they fall apart every year come playoff time, and that's the Dallas Cowboys. What does Dallas have to do to win a playoff game? Well, I've lived my whole life talking trash about Dallas, so I'd be happy <laughs> to do that. You know, as a Niner fan, you can't root for Dallas. But personally, I don't think they're that far away. Um, I think their quickest fix would be for Jerry Jones to get the heck out of the way, but that's not going to happen. Um, you know, I think they got to improve the run game. I, I love Dak. I think he's actually really good. Um, you know, he's the Cowboys quarterback, so when they don't win, he gets all the blame. But I think he's a top QB in the league. You know, I just think they lack an actual real running game. Um, you know, and despite what you think about the NFL, you still got to be able to run the ball a little bit when you need to. And, you know, I think Zeke's on the back end of his career, obviously, and they had some injuries up front. And, you know, they invested a lot in the wide receiver room. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked if Zeke gets waived or cut um, after free agency starts or whatever. Um, and then go out and try to get a running back that can come in and kind of give them some juice back there. Um, Pollard's really good. Um, you know, I just don't know if he's an every-down guy. So, I don't know. I hope they never win, um, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, you're not the only one here who can give hot takes. Okay. So, I'm going to give the ice-cold one, and I'm going to give a smoking hot one. Ice-cold take. Zeke was a flash in the pan. He was never that good. He got lucky for a year and a half. That was it. Now for the hot take. Saquon Barkley and Ezekiel Elliott are clones. And Saquon Barkley is just as trash long term as Ezekiel Elliott is. Yeah, that is a hot take <laughs> and a cold take. I got to disagree a little bit on the Zeke Elliott take. Um, it pains me to say because um, I don't like Ohio State and I don't like uh, Dallas, but... Zeke was really good for a time in his life, like really good. Um, Saquon, I, he just can't stay healthy. But I don't know. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to see the same version of those two guys ever again. I think it's over. I think Chris McCaffrey's the same. Really? You think he's done? You think it's I mean, I don't think he's done. I just don't know if you'll ever see him be MVP caliber guy again. When he's healthy, he's obviously really good. But that's why the – the life of an NFL running back averages three to four years. You know, guy, those guys get beat on and they just can't stay healthy. So, you know, once those injuries start piling up when you're young, it's hard to stay healthy when you're old. Oh, for sure. And, you know, if I'm not mistaken, Christian McCaffrey had astronomical carries in college. I mean, they work the fool out of them. Yeah. Panthers have too. And the Panthers have too, but I, I will say this for Christian McCaffrey. The one reason I would say that he might be able to circumvent some of that running back shelf life issue, even though he has had his injury issues, is that he is so good catching the ball out of the backfield. He is almost an extension of the passing game in the fact that if you lined him up in the slot, no doubt. It, it would be just like having another excellent receiver. See, I think there. he can continue his career. So, that'd be, you're right. He does do those other things. I just think you're not going to see this guy who's getting 1,500 yards rushing and 1,000 yards receiving. And, you know, I just don't think he has – he's not going to be able to last long with that. If they use him more on third downs, put him in the slot, you know, give him, you know, 10 to 12 carries, something along that, 
maybe he does extend his career. I just think that him being the workhorse for a team probably is not happening. Now, if he went to the Chiefs or something, you know, then he'd be in like the perfect situation scheme wise. Well, and that brings me back to what I was about to add on to that. And, and he's another one of these guys who's feel victim to location. And uh, the Panthers, ever since that run to the Super Bowl, Cam Newton have just been, I'm not going to say they've been terrible, they've just been flat. You know, they've, they've made moves, they've tried to do things to improve their sales, and everything they do it just seems just, just not quite work out for them. And you're right, a guy like Run CMC, you know, whereas he could go to five, six other teams and probably be that guy for the next four or five years, it's never going to happen in Charlotte. No. It just, there's nothing he can do about that. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for another break. We will be right back. Tag and Mech Suspension in Ahoski, North Carolina is your complete number one dirt bike sales and service performance center. Tag and Mech offers new and used dirt bikes and ATVs. Tradings are also welcome. Tag and Mech in Ahoski also buys used bikes. We at Tag and Mech has a full service repair, maintenance, suspension, and racing performance shop. If you need any accessories, we have a fully stocked showroom full of all this good stuff that you need at the track. Tag and Mech Suspension is everything dirt bike included, and we also have a custom bike graphic department. Check us out online at tagandmechsuspension.com or call us at 252-862-4867. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and it is time to talk about Another very controversial topic around football, and that is Brian Flores and this class action lawsuit about the unfair way, in his opinion, that the NFL goes about hiring head coaches. Now, before we ever get into the deep stuff, what is your opinion on the matter? How do you feel about, I, I guess just to put it in broad terms, how do you feel about everything that's going on right now? I mean, the NFL has completely dropped the ball. I think the Rooney rule is terrible. Um, I think the idea behind it when they started it was the right idea, but the way they've gone about it is horrible. I mean, it's clear that minority coaches don't get a fair shake every every cycle um, in the hiring process. Um, but I think it's deeper than just head coaching positions. It's coordinator positions. It's head coaching positions. It's management positions. Um, you know, the league is 75%, 80% black athletes. There's no excuse why those guys can't progress or black people can't be in management and coaching positions at the top either. Um, so that's where I stand on it. Um, I think if people just went about it and just hired, you know, I don't know. Did, did they just, the NFL's dropping the ball on it. They, they are, and I'll, I'll say this, and this is the only way that I've been able to make sense of it. And when I say make sense of it, I made sense of it in the fact that I've realized it makes no sense from this standpoint. It seems like, even though we just had two of the youngest head coaches that ever played in a Super Bowl play against each other, it almost seems like if you were to forego playing football after college and go right into a coaching career, and slowly but surely work your way up through the ranks. That way, you are in a much better position to get a coordinator coaching, any any coaching staff job than you are to be a middling to great football player for 10, 12 years and then decide to go into coaching. It's almost like they value that coaching experience more than they do actual experience playing the game that you're supposedly coaching. And it makes no sense to me. Because I would much rather have somebody who just got done playing the game, knows exactly how it's being played today on my coaching staff, than I would have somebody who's been at Bowling Green University coaching the kicker for four years come up and, and be a coordinator. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, I do understand what you're saying, but I also think the best players aren't always the best coaches either. Yeah, um, I agree. So there are... There's a fine line in, in both of that, um, on both sides of that argument. So, you know, I don't know. Obviously, way above my pay grade, I have my own opinion, obviously, about what the right thing to do is with, with the whole hiring process. Um, 
you know, so the NFL's got a lot of work to do and, you know, a lot of things in front of them if they want to get it right. They do, and I'll say this. This is my opinion, my opinion alone. My name is Ashton Handlegs Bass, and if anybody asks, you can tell them I said it. The only way you're going to fix the coaching problem in the NFL is to simply have it be this. No matter whether you're black, white, brown, Asian, Latina, whatever, the only way you fix this problem is to somehow find a way to make it so that the best candidate, no matter the color, gets the job. Now, that being said, 99% of your owners in the NFL are elderly white guys. And we all know that most of the time those guys are setting their ways and it's a good old boy system. But the good old boy system, I mean, look at a lot of these teams, it, it, it works for about three years and then it's time to find somebody else. Well, when you've got to replace a coach every three years, then the good old boy system isn't working. You look at guys like Coach Tomlin. Tomlin's been in Pittsburgh for what is it, almost a decade now? 15 years. 15 years. And, you know, he's one of the better head coaches. And I think Lovey Smith, uh, Lovey Smith just got a, what was it, a coordinator position? He just got the head coach head coach with the Texans. With the Texans. I like Lovey Smith. Lovey Smith was another guy who I thought was a really good coach, and I thought he deserved another shake. And, you know, by all accounts, Brian Flores, you know, if, if it turns out what he was saying is true about what was going on in the front office in Miami, He's another guy who deserves another shot at because even when the front office was pushing back against him, he still managed to have those guys playing good football towards the end of the season. But nothing changes until the guy who's right for the job gets the job. <coughs> but since we're talking about the Texans, I'll say this and then we'll wrap up football. Deshaun Watson, we've talked about every other quarterback. Let's let's go ahead and, and say it. Where is he going? What's he doing? What what is your opinion on Deshaun Watson? Because I'll tell you right now, my opinion is this. We can talk if, buts, and maybes till the cows come home, but until he's officially cleared of all those charges, he's not going anywhere but to the couch. I agree with that. I mean, the allegations against him are pretty negligent. Um, so until you get to the bottom of it and things get figured out, I don't. I do not know if he's going to get another chance, um, especially in today's to society, I don't know if there's a team willing to make him the face of the franchise, but if he does get cleared of those charges, then obviously he's going to get picked up pretty fast. Oh, for sure. He's, I mean, he's he's a top guy. If he can get, well, I say he is. I hadn't seen him play in two years. When last time I saw him play, he was a top guy. Right. But you're right. It's a shame that we live in a world now where used to you could look up the sports sports players as heroes. Nowadays, you've got to worry about what's going on behind closed doors with almost all of these guys. Another guy, Alvin Kamara. Does Alvin Kamara, is, is he a saint next year, or where, where does Alvin Kamara go from here? Because if, if I'm the saints, we're already rebuilding. Maybe it's time to just part ways. I think the only reason that's, that Kamara wouldn't be back with the saints is because of their salary cap situation. This just makes it easier to get rid of them. Um, but, you know, if they're going to blow up the organization and start over, you know, then that may, maybe makes it easier as well. But I don't know. The Saints are in a tough spot being 70 million or whatever over the cap. Not sure where they are quarterback wise. Um, so, yeah, that'll be interesting. I mean, personally, I think they made a huge mistake not just letting Taysom Hill take the reins. I, I realized that maybe they were trying to build him into an all purpose threat, but. As we've seen a lot of these all-purpose guys, it doesn't really work out in the NFL. I, I think that if they'd give him the reins, give him a year to get the rust off, get him shined up, make him into what he could be, we could be looking at another guy who's able to move like Lamar Jackson. And, you know, maybe not the most accurate arm in the NFL, but good enough to win you some football games. But, you know, the old adage goes, you've got two quarterbacks, you've got no quarterbacks. Mm, that's true. But anyway... Let's move on and talk about a little something else for a few minutes before we wrap this thing up. Like a little basketball? Oh, yeah. I love basketball. So, who's who's your... Uh, I'm a Miami Heat fan. You're a Miami Heat number fan. Number one team in the East right now. Number one team. They are the number one team yeah. in the East. Uh, Butler looked great. The All-Star game. Yeah, Jimmy Butler is a good player. You know, he fits the Heat culture. Um, you know, if the Heat can stay healthy, I think they got a chance at this thing. 
Speaking of staying healthy, let's stick with the heat for a minute. Victor Oladipo is supposedly getting healthy and coming back. How how much does that change the dynamic of that heat team? If if they're getting the Victor Oladipo that was healthy from 2018, it definitely does because he's an all-star caliber guy. He scored ball, um, gives him a big boost off the bench. Uh, either way, I think it helps him because, I mean, he's just a natural scorer. So, I mean... You know, if he's if he's coming in with that second unit, you know, and he can get be out there with, you know, Tyler Hero and some of the other guys they got, I think it helps him. So I think that's why they didn't make a trade at the All Star um, break because they're banking on him being healthy. That's why they traded for him last year. Well, and I, I I like that team. I I wish that they'd have kept Drogic around in some capacity. I realize that he's getting old, legs don't work quite as good as they used to, and they've got a lot of good talent around the, around the perimeter, but it, you can't replace that kind of experience, which granted they've got Jimmy Butler, they've got Oladipo, they've got guys that have been there and done that, but Drogic has been so good for that team for years now, I really hated to see him go. What is the other young boy's name uh, on the Heat team? He just broke one of the uh, fastest to, to a certain number of three points made. Duncan Robinson. Duncan Robinson, he is a good-looking guy, too. Yeah, no, he's a guy that, you know, was undrafted. You know, the Heat do a great job in their organization of taking these undrafted guys and getting them into their program and developing them. And, you know, they always are bringing along three-point shooters. So, you know, he's had a nice little run. He, he kind of makes things go at times with him running off ball screens and just kind of circling around the defense. Teams have to react to that and kind of shift their defense. So... You know, he, he's going to be a big part. You know, he was a little cold at the beginning of the season, wasn't shooting as well, but I think he's now kind of getting into form and they're going to need him down the stretch. Another year or so, where does where does Tyler Hero find himself as far as it shakes out? Is he, do you look at him as a solid number three guy or is he a six man off the bench just to give you some energy? Where does Tyler Hero shake out? Me being biased as a Heat fan, I think Tyler Hero is going to end up being, he should have been an all-star this year. Um, you know, I think he's a guy that easily gets hated on because of, you know, some of the antics, I guess, that social media killed him on in the bubble. You know, he played really well in the bubble, and then last year he kind of had that sophomore slump, if you want to call it that. But, you know, the guy's 21 years old. Uh, he can make plays. He can dribble. He can make plays off the bounce. He can shoot threes. And I think he's only going to keep getting better. I said, I mean, is he going to be a superstar number one type guy? No, but I think he's a solid number two. Um, you know, if you're forming a super team, which seems to be what teams do, he's a great number three. Um, but I can see that guy being a multiple time All Star. But before it's all said and done, that's awesome. I, I don't, I haven't seen enough of him. You're right. He played amazing in the bubble. And he had, like they say, the sophomore slump. And a lot of people were starting to ask, not me personally, a lot of people were starting to ask, was this a flash in the pan? Was this going to be another Jeremy Lin, Lin Sanity situation where he's great for a year or two and then it's over with? But I think that Eric Spolster does such a good job of developing guys down there that even if he does have a slump you know, last year and maybe a little bit this year, even though he seems to be playing pretty good this year, that he'll eventually come out of it. And you're right, he does look like a great, you know, for the teams nowadays, he's probably a number three piece, but he is a great number three piece. But uh, I can't, I can't claim any particular team in the NBA. I'm a fan of the stars. That being said, guys like me who are fans of the stars are getting ready to see two, actually three of the stars we haven't seen in a very long time hit the floor again. Ben Simmons is going to be wearing black. Hot take: He's not a star. Well, I mean. There's a lot of people that would agree with you, as a matter of fact. But he is getting ready to hit the uh, floor. And as I said, governor uh, and mayor of New York have decided they're going to start easing COVID protocols. So that means we'll get to see Kyrie Irving again. Now, here's a hot take. Kyrie Irving has never been a superstar, in my opinion. But you do get a good point in Kyrie back for home games, finally, which means that this dynamic of him being what they all considered a part-time player this year, we get to get that off the table and Durant gets his full ensemble back around him. Do they take off like they were supposed to with Harden, or is it just more of the same? I think they're going to be a better team with Ben Simmons, um, even though I don't think he's as good of an individual player as James Harden. 
but having three ball dominant guys just isn't, wasn't going to work. Um, obviously, Kyrie needs the ball. KD needs the ball. Where Ben Simmons can play off the ball, he plays way better defense than James Harden does. So I think it fits the roster better. If the Nets do take off, I think it'll be because some of these other pieces that they were able to bring in. Um, obviously, Ben Simmons is going to have to play a big part of it, but having Seth Curry come on board, bringing in Dragic, um, you know, is going to be big for them just from, you know, a guy coming off the bench that can run the point, that's a veteran guy that can shoot threes, can score off the ball, you know. So, you know, as a Heat fan, I think they made those moves to try to catch the Heat. <laughs> well, well, we'll keep it in the East, and we'll talk about Harden's new team. And I'll, I'll start it off by saying this. Harden's always been a guy. He preferred the way that they played in Houston. He has the ball in his hands 90% of the time, but he needed those pieces around him. Maybe not necessarily at the same caliber as him or star players, but he needed guys he could trust with the rock when he ever did pass it. I think that going and having him be – a big man who can play in the paint, get bruised up a little bit. Not that they let them bruise them up anymore in the NBA. They've gotten so soft. It, it's almost reminiscent of those Steve Nash, Amari Stoudemire teams where Nash did a predominant amount of ball handling, but he always had that big man in the paint who could he could dish it to and get, get the score. And I think that with the fact that Embiid's actually going to finally have some help after having to sit there and watch Embiid, or excuse me, not Embiid, Simmons do nothing for years, it's, that team's going to explode. See, I'm a little less – I love I love Embiid. I think he's one of the top five players in the league right now, honestly. I'll say this too. Make no mistake. I realize that James Harden right now is built like an NFL running back. Homeboy has got to lose some weight, but sorry to cut you off. But I, I will say I realize that there's a long road to go on that one. I'm a little less sure that Harden and Embiid match up um, at a, compared to Ben Simmons being able to kind of flow in there with Kyrie and KD. You know, because you're right, Harden really thrived in the Houston system where everybody kind of got out of the paint. They let him work it from the top, you know, drive and kick, get to the basket, draw fouls. You know, I think if you're asking Embiid to get out of the paint to shoot jump shots, you're taking away his greatness. He can shoot. Um, he can get points out there. But I think the offense still needs to run through Joel Embiid for them to be a championship caliber team. I think he's a generational big. Um, there's really, other than Jokic, there's nobody like him. Um, so we'll see. I mean, they obviously got talent. They brought in a superstar, and then the NBA superstars win. So we'll see how it all goes. Well, and you're right. He is definitely a generational big. That being said, the role of a big has changed so much over the past few years. For the first time since, I believe, if not 2014, 2016, a big won the three-point contest this year in yep. Carl Anthony Towns. Is, is he just destined to – live in mediocrity in Minnesota or is Minnesota going to finally pull themselves up by the bootstraps or do you see Cat getting out of town? It's hard for me to envision the T-Wolves actually winning anything of substance in the West. Um, you know, and if they trade them, they're just going to live in this sick cycle of being mediocre, below average. So... I think they got to make the decision that Milwaukee made, which is, you know what, yeah, we're we're a small market team, but we're going to operate at a higher level than that, and they got to actually push the envelope with their, you know, their salary and pay into the luxury tax and those kind of things, you know. So, because the West is a tough mountain to climb, you know. So they, I don't know. I think he'll be stuck in mediocrity. I just don't see how you justify trading the guy unless you're just trying to start over again for the tenth time. Well, and there's a lot of good young teams in the West, but even though there's some good, there's some great young teams at the top of that conference, the two teams that I thought were going to be the teams to make the run this year and finally dethrone some of these guys that were constantly seeing out the West with Portland and Dallas. Both teams trade away their, basically their number two pieces with Dallas trading Porzingis to the uh, Washington Wizards and C.J. McCollum going to New Orleans. I don't. I, I, I cannot fathom why Dallas would get rid of Porzingis. I, I mean, it felt like such a great match with him and Doncic. Doncic, 
Now, granted, they've had some health issues with Porzingis, and they've had some health issues with Hardaway Jr. It just it I felt like if they could ever get all on the same page and helped at the same time, that was the team that could finally take it all away like Nowitzki did back. What was that? Ten years ago? Ten, twelve years ago? Be eleven. It was two thousand eleven. They beat the Heat. That's, this man's a genius. I couldn't ask for for a better guess today. But what possesses a team like Portland or a team like Dallas to do something like that? I mean, I'm not in the building every day, but just you kind of hear some of the read some of the reports, hear some of the things that are people are saying. I think he was always hurt, and he was really high maintenance. Um, you know where. Luca seems like he's more of just this blue collar, show up to work, get it done every day kind of guy. Not to say that they didn't mesh well um, and that, you know, friendship, but it clearly wasn't clicking on the basketball floor. So, um, you know, the, the, I think the biggest mistake that teams make in sports in general is trying to make something work longer than if, if it's showing that's not working, go ahead and get out of the deal rather than trying to pound the old proverbial square peg in a round hole. You know, and obviously it didn't work for him in Dallas. So, you know, the Wizards were willing to give up some pieces for him. Um, so they made the move and they kind of go from there. I think they need a wing um, to really help Luca kind of take that next step, that off the ball score that can kind of take over the game when he needs to. On the other side of that trade, is Porzingis enough to keep Bradley Beal in DC? You know, every year uh, they, I hope the Heat trade for Bradley Beal because they always act like that they're interested <laughs> in the guy. But, you know, I think Bradley Beal and Dame are two guys that, you know, which I respect, they're extremely loyal to the teams that drafted them, you know. And, you know, I'd, at this point, I think Bradley Beal's going to stay in Washington forever, um, you know, and he'll be okay if he doesn't win the title. And, can go down in Wizards history as being the greatest ever or one of the greatest. And I think Dame Lillard will do the same thing. One of the things that always bothered me on the opposite side of that coin, I can appreciate loyalty to a team and, and it's great to see. I hate to see those teams waste generational talent. And Damian Lillard, I mean, he's, he's an all-star. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He's, He's got great moves. He's got great ball handling skills. He can shoot really well. He's quick. But th that's another team that traded away one of their better guys in CJ McCollum. I mean, I realize you still got your center, but if you, it seems like in today's NBA, if you don't have three players, you know, at the top of the food chain, then you're just hoping hoping for the middle of the pack at this point. Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes back to what I just said. I mean, they. They gave it a run in Portland. They made two Western Conference Finals, I think. Wasn't enough with C.J. McCollum to win the title. Um, so I think they're just at a point organizationally where they feel like they weren't winning the title with them. Um, you have to make a decision. You're trading Dame Lillard or C.J. McCollum. So they took they took the McCollum route. And, you know, obviously this year they're probably not doing anything, but they'll probably be looking to make some moves going into the offseason now that they got a little bit more money getting McCollum's salary out of there. Well, I'm gonna try and pull another hot take out of you. Let's 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 see what your take is on this. Speaking about where CJ ended up at, Pelicans. Yeah. Does, does Zion just not want to play for New Orleans? What's what's the deal down there? Is he trying his best to get out of town? Well, I mean, if you hear some of these people talking, it just seems like him and his family don't want to be in New Orleans. They want to get him out of town. Um, I personally think. He's overrated. Um, he's a freaky athlete. He should play football. Um, but he, I don't know. I, I think he's actually kind of sabotaging his career a little bit right now, and it's not because he's in New Orleans. So, I mean, another great Duke alumni, J.J. Reddick, has pretty much come out and said, you know, hey, for lack of, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, and for lack of a better term, you know, hey, man, Get off your ass. You just had this great talent, CJ McCollum, come down and you haven't even reached out to the guy, said hello, anything like that. And I mean, on top of that, yeah, I realize that they also lost a few pieces, but New Orleans has a great young nucleus down there where I'm not going to sit here and say that I know that they're all going to work out together and it's going to be a great team, but they have some great pieces, some great 
if if for nothing else, if it doesn't work out as them as a whole, they're they're still trade pieces. They they still have pieces to move and fit to where they could be a contender. And I just feel like. I, I don't know, like yourself, I just think Zion's trying his best to get out of town as quick as he can. That being said, I don't know that I'd say he's overrated as much as it is that I can't tell if it's just his lack of drive that's caused his conditioning issues or if it's just that he is going to be another one of these guys like you talk about before Zingas high maintenance where somebody's constantly going to have to be, hey man, we, we've got to get you a personal trainer, we've got to get you a dietitian, we've got to you've got to stay in peak shape in order for you to be able to play the game like you're used to playing the game. Because he went from being a big fish at Duke in a relatively smaller pond to being a minnow in the sea that is the NBA. And I, I have to agree with you. I think he's just trying his best to get out of town. Yeah, I think so, too. Ladies and gentlemen, we have certainly enjoyed it this evening. We appreciate you watching. My name is Ashton Hamlegs Bass. This is the head football coach at Chowan University, Coach Hall. Appreciate you. As always, if you enjoyed the show, be a friend, tell a friend. If you didn't, well, pretend it never happened. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.